Hello, and thank you all so much for joining us for the Visual DX National Kodachromes. This is our fifth Kodachromes of 2020. My name is Dr. Art Prepier. I'm a dermatologist at the University of Rochester and CEO of Visual DX. We're thrilled to host these webinars, especially during COVID when it's hard to have in-person teaching. Uh, we're providing meaningful virtual education, hopefully, and we're planning to do more of these in 2021. These Kodachrons have been a wonderful addition to our Visual DX offerings, and we're thankful you're able to join us this evening. I'd like to start with a few housekeeping notes. You'll be on mute but we welcome and encourage questions. So please use the Q&A button to ask questions during the session. We're also gonna test your knowledge with an app called Kahoot, spelled K-A-H-O-O-T. If you haven't downloaded it, download it on your phone, on your smartphone, either through Google Play for Android or the App Store, Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T, because at the end of the presentation, we're gonna have a, a quiz and the winner will have a prize. So it's always fun to do the Kahoot. With, now, with that, now I'd like to introduce Robin Garris. Robin Garris is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Dermatology at UPMC Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. She's a board certified pediatric dermatologist and uh, certified in pediatrics as well. She founded the Pediatric Telem Teledermatology Consultation Service and has over 15 years of clinical experience in this field. Today, she's gonna to present Kodachrome cases highlighting infant and neonatal dermatology. Uh, welcome, Dr. Garris, and thank you so much for being our host of this series. Art and Kim, thank you both so much for setting this up and also for the service that you provide um, educationally to the dermatology programs that I know have had a difficult and an unusual year. Can you guys hear me okay? I just want to confirm. You sound, okay. per sound perfect. Okay, wonderful. So Kim, I appreciate your help advancing the slides. If you'd like to start with the first slide. Tonight I'm going to talk about neonatal dermatology and that is, as you know, more than a 45 minute talk. So I'm going to try to accomplish a few things. I'm gonna explore the visual presentation of common as well as some more rare entities so there will be some easy slides in here that you're going to know right away, but I present those just as a juxtaposition between how you tell those apart from the more rare things. Um, I'd like to have you know by the end of this talk when to initiate a further workup in the neonate who presents to clinic with abnormal skin findings. And then finally, we'll test our knowledge, um, as Art mentioned, with a short Kahoot quiz. Next slide. So let's start off by talking about some vascular processes in the neonate. And again, this could be a whole talk in and of itself. Next. This is a very common referral that I get. And most people in the room are going to know immediately what this is. This is a baby who has uh, what might in layperson's terms be called angel kisses or stork bites. But they're a little bit more exuberant um, and numerous and in multiple locations that we might, than we might see. And so often pediatricians will refer this to the dermatologist to make sure that there's no other workup needed or that maybe could this be more of a true vascular malformation. Next slide. So this is what we call a nevus simplex. Next. A nevus simplex is probably one of the most common vascular lesions in infants. It pathologically represents persistent fetal circulation and the most common locations to see it are the nape of the neck, the glabella, the medial eyelids, and then the philtrum. Other common names are stork bite, angel kiss, salmon patch. Uh, there are no abnormal associations with these, even though they do often occur in the midline, which might throw some people off. And most of them gradually fade within one to two years. So I like to photograph these at the first visit. Um, and then when parents come back for follow-up, we can document that they are fading gradually and improving. And I think that provides a lot of reassurance. Next. So here's something that looks very similar. It looks what we just spoke about. Um, it looks to be a midline occipital, almost like a nevus simplex. However, I wanna point out that there are several other differences in the middle of this. So there's an area where it almost looks like a healing erosion 
uh, what we might call aplasia cutis in the center of it. And if you look, surrounding that area of aplasia cutis is a little bit of a hair color sign. So a classic Neva simplex should not have other associated abnormalities like that. And this isn't quite on the nape of the neck, it's on the midline occiput, and it has two other associations with it. So this should be a red flag that it's not your classic Neva simplex. Advance, please. This is actually an atretic encephalocele. And Beth Verlet uh, wrote a series of, of these cases up several years ago, and almost all of them presented with a midline occipital, uh, what looked like a nevus flamius, with either a secondary area of aplasia cutis and or a hair color or a hair whirl sign. So I just want to point that out as um, a difference compared to your classic nevus simplex. Next. Let's explore a couple more of those cases. So what are my safe rules by which to practice? And we talk about this in our residency program all the time. Um, we never wanna miss anything, but we also don't wanna overwork up healthy kids in terms of spending and their morbidity. So for me, any midline lesion of the scalp, face, or spine should prompt at least a consideration for diagnostic imaging of those areas to rule out occult spinal or CNS dysraphism or possible syndromic associations. Exceptions to that would be the nevus simplex, as we discussed, on the nape of the neck um, or on the occipital scalp in the absence of secondary findings like aplasia cutis, a nodule, or a hair color sign. Now, when you start having two midline abnormalities simultaneously, that way increases your risk of having an underlying abnormality. So if you're on the fence trying to decide who to work up, start counting your midline abnormalities. Two or more is too many for me. And then finally, and we'll explore some of these image-wise, any midline lesion that swells with Valsalva when the baby's crying or straining is probably not normal. Next. So let's look at a couple of these pictures. Here's a baby that presented us with what looks like a tiny little Neva simplex, but it's at the base of the spine, which is not a location we discussed as being common. And you can see there's sort of a stellate area of almost bound down skin. And you can also see sort of a surrounding pallor and an asymmetric gluteal cleft. So we have at least two midline abnormalities here, if not three or four, uh, and you can go ahead and advance. This on MRI um, ended up being a tethered cord with a dermal sinus tract. So this is somebody that should probably be hooked up with pediatric neurosurgery. Next. Similarly, here's another baby who had a very unexciting midline kind of vascular stain or what might look like a nevus simplex, but it's not on the area we talked about. I see sort of a fullness right above the midline gluteal cleft. The cleft is pretty symmetric. I don't see a plagia cutis, I don't see a hair tuft, but it is a little bit full and it's a little bit bright. So we did end up, I was on the fence about this one, we did end up ending, imaging this child. Next. And this ended up being what is termed diasta matamelia, which is a longitudinal splitting of the spinal cord. And this isn't necessarily something that needs to be surgically fixed, but it certainly is something that I did refer to neurosurgery just to get their opinion. Next. And then one final case, I think everyone in this group, no matter where you are, would agree that this is abnormal. I will tell you to my surprise, um, so let's just review the abnormal findings. We have a midline vascular stain. We have a midline protuberant mass occupying the upper portion of the gluteal cleft. And then we have a gluteal cleft that starts this way and then veers off to the side. So this child was failing to meet his milestones. The pediatrician had referred him to physical therapy because he was not crawling at the expected age. When we saw this baby in the clinic, we got an MRI of the spine, which was normal. However, an MRI of the pelvis demonstrated a seven centimeter presacral mass which ended up being a sacrococcygeal teratoma. So this child ended up in hematology oncology. So the skin really is a window into the body um, and we are, sort of have the luxury of not always needing to do further studies um, to know when there might be a problem. Next slide. So let's talk about other situations that might mimic an Eva simplex. Here's a toddler, so not an infant, and I know that's a little outside the scope of the talk, but I wanted to present it. This toddler came into clinic with the chief complaint of multiple new red macules. So he wasn't born with these. There was a family history of a maternal aunt who had similar lesions on the skin. 
And the mother said every few months, you would get a few new ones. So these aren't on the midline, they aren't on the face, they aren't injured typical areas. Um, they don't look like hemangiomas. So this was a little bit of a, a perplexing case. Uh, next slide. This ended up being a RASA1 mutation. Next. So there is a syndrome called capillary malformation, arteriovenous malformation syndrome, and it is an autosomal dominant inheritance. In most cases, the capillary lesions are multifocal. Sometimes they can be present at birth, but this is the distinguishing feature of the syndrome, and I want to drive this home. They increase in number with age. So the other vascular stains um, or capillary, persistent capillary circulation, Nevis simplex, Port wine stains, they're typically maximal at birth, and you don't expect to see new ones over time. So these represent tiny arteriovenous malformations in the skin. And the very important association to be aware of is that they can also have arteriovenous fistulas in other locations in the body, specifically the spine, um, on the face extremities, and in the CNS. They're not typically in the liver or the lung. And this is caused by a mutation in the, in the RAS P21, protein activator one gene. Um, this baby did have that mutation, which I think was very interesting, or this toddler, I should say. Um, and then what we do is we usually do send them to those other subspecialties for screening. Um, we ordered the screening ourselves, MRI and MRA of, um, of the spine and CNS. And at the time of presentation, they were negative, but they need to be followed over time because they can develop uh, sequentially. Next. So here's another picture that most people in this audience are going to say right off the bat, I know what this is. Next, this is a port wine stain. So not too exciting. This falls under the category of what we call a vascular malformation. These are typically present at birth. They are static. They are non-proliferative. And so we don't expect them to grow or become brighter or thicker over time. However, we also don't expect them to fade over time. Next. So the important association was something like this when the vascular stain is present in the V1 distribution is Sturge-Weber syndrome. Sturge-Weber is caused by a somatic mosaic mutation in the GNAQ gene, and it leads to vascular malformations in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So important associations with uh, vascular malformations in the V1 distribution are glaucoma, so extra pressure in the eye, secondary to extra vessels in the eye, just like we have extra vessels in the skin. And then seizures as well as developmental delay or mental retardation. Um, this can occur from extra uh, vessels in the leptomeninges. So it's very interesting to know how to work up these kids. You know, some people like to try to spare children uh, imaging studies, and so they might send to ophthalmology and say, well, if the child doesn't have glaucoma, that's reassuring. However, you can't use that um, as an excluding factor. The absence of glaucoma does not uh, ensure the absence of abnormal findings on MRI. So you really have to send to ophthalmology and do the MRI. Now, the younger the child, the more sophisticated the study that's needed in order to pick up these malformations. So in an infant or a neonate, you're going to need to order an MRI. As the child gets older, and those uh, vascular malformations in the leptomeninges may calcify, you may be able to pick them up on a CT or in a much older child on an X-ray as train track calcifications. Next. So here's another example of a baby who had Sturge-Weber syndrome. Having bilateral uh, vascular malformations in the V1 distribution does increase the chance of having it, but it's still a fairly low chance. About 20 to 30 percent of these children have the full Sturge-Weber syndrome. This baby had already actually had seizures at the time of presentation to dermatology, so the diagnosis was not really in question. Next. So let's look at mimickers of vascular malformations. Here's an adorable baby, and I apologize for the low quality of the images. Sometimes when we don't meet children until several months of age and we don't have the luxury of our own images, now that every parent has an iPhone or some kind of a smartphone, we can ask the parents for images. And sometimes I do photograph the parents' photographs on their phone just to document progression. So this was the parents' photograph of their neonate at the time of birth. You can see there's just a little bit of flushing um, red lesion on the left cheek right under the eye. It's not too exciting. You might even say, oh, that's just a little readiness from birth trauma. Next. 
here's what it looked like a couple weeks later. I think everyone in this group would say, hold on, this is highly abnormal. But at this point, um, they were not referred to us. Next. So this is the first time I met this baby. Um, this is clearly not a vascular malformation because as we discussed, and you can show one more picture if you wanna advance. As we discussed, vascular malformations are static. They don't grow, they don't recede, and things that don't grow and recede do not classically ulcerate. So the fact that we had that much of a change between picture one and picture two is a huge red flag and I wouldn't wanna see that child immediately. Um, this is where I really love teledermatology because in the old days, and I mean like 10 years ago, you know, somebody might call and just wait in the queue of the next available visit. But now um, our front desk knows that anybody with anything red that they're born with, they get in that day or the next day. Um, or they can be offered teledermatology. And if we saw this image by teledermatology, we would expedite um, seeing that patient as soon as possible. So this is obviously a very aggressive plaque-like infantile hemangioma. This child was seen in the pre-propranolol era before propranolol was described um, to be highly effective. And so you can see uh, between picture three and four, she got high dose steroids, even the Christine, and became very cushing -like. Um, She had very poor cosmetic outcome. And so um, it's really a shame to have missed uh, the opportunity to treat this child uh, between picture one and picture two. So I think we need to make ourselves more available whenever possible. Next. Let's show a few more examples of similar debilitating hemangiomas. So here's a baby who presented at the age of five weeks and they were from fairly far out um, in the community. So they drove several hours to get to our office. Um, she presented with a large facial hemangioma um, that's really in a huge metamere. I wanna point out the ulceration on the upper lip. Earlier in her life, somebody thought that this might be a vascular malformation and had even mentioned Sturge Weber to her because it was bilateral. But again, as we discussed, um, vascular malformations do not proliferate and so things that don't proliferate should not ulcerate. So the ulceration of the upper lip right off the bat tells me that this is not a vascular malformation. This is an infantile hemangioma. The other way we know that is it's not sort of a homogenous color or texture. You can see certain areas that are bright or red. That left eyelid is very puffy, so you can know that there's subcutaneous hemangioma there. So we direct admitted this child from clinic, obtained an MRI of the head and neck, which showed an aggregate internal carotid, as well as a tortuous basilar artery. There was hemangioma present in the airway and above, above the vocal cords. There was no aortic coarctation and the EKG was normal and she was diagnosed with FACES syndrome, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, started on propranolol and developed significant improvement in her lip ulceration, as well as flattening and lightening of the plaque-like facial hemangiomas. So anytime you see what you are unsure as to whether it's a vascular malformation or hemangioma, I can't stress to you enough the importance of short interval follow-up. And I don't mean I'll see you in two months, at your next well visit. I mean, like, I'll see you in two weeks. And if you think it gets brighter between now and then, I want you to call me immediately because we have a window of opportunity for treating these children before their deformities. And then the workup is very important. Next. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about faces. I think the preferred term is faces association as opposed to faces syndrome. Oh, let's go back one slide if we can. Okay, so FACES stands for posterior fossa malformations, hemangiomas, which are classically plaque-like and facial, arterial anomalies, and these can either be present at the time of presentation or they can develop over time, sometimes with moya-moya-like phenomenon. C is coarctation of the aorta and cardiac defects. And I wanna stress that sometimes the coarcs in these babies are not classic coarcs. They can be what we call high line coarcs. So if you're not at a pediatric institution for your ultrasound or for your echocardiograms, you wanna specifically request that the echocardiogram include the neck vessels so that you don't miss a high line coarc. Eye abnormalities, and I'm gonna stress this is cataracts, not glaucoma. So Sturge Weber syndrome is glaucoma, whereas FACES association is cataracts. And then S is sternal clefting and or supra umbilical raphe. Um, and we'll go over some of those pictures. 
The inheritance is unknown and somewhat isolated, although more than 80% of these babies are female. So there's a proposed X-linked dominant um, inheritance, but it's unproven. They can also have, interestingly, thyroid abnormalities, such as a lingual thyroid or a congenital hypothyroidism. So remember, as you're working them up with all the imaging studies, not to forget to check thyroid hormone. Um, next slide. So I find it very interesting. Um, unlike Sturge Weber that we classically associate with uh, V1, V2, V3, faces look similar, but they're not quite the same distribution. These are the, the plaque-like hemangiomas are distrib distributed more in embryologic metamers. And so this is a diagram from a, a journal of um, pediatrics um, showing the embryologic metamers. And these are the segments uh, that we sometimes see hemangiomas in association with FASA syndrome. So we think FASA syndrome occurs very early in embryologic development. So at the same time that the plaque-like hemangiomas are forming, the underlying anatomy that's forming in those areas may form abnormally. So when we think about a plaque-like hemangioma in segment one, those are more likely to have associated cerebrovascular or ocular anomalies, whereas the lower facial hemangiomas in segment three are more likely to have ventral um, defects, such as the su supra-umbilical raphe, um, as well as the cardiovascular defects, such as the coarctation. Now that's not 100%, so it's not like we'll fail to work each kid up for every one of those things, but it is an interesting association. Next. So I just wanted to show you an example of a baby and you know you can kind of get a sense of our clinic. Don't worry, all these kids didn't show up on the same day. This is not how, our, how one day in clinic goes. These are compiled from many, many years of practice, but this is the first time I ever met this baby in my clinic. And again, from several hours away, and there was a little bit of redness at the newborn visit and the pediatrician said, come on back at two months. The parents were very obedient and didn't call in between. And you can see um, this segment for right down the middle of the midline face hemangioma. She also had to have some on the posterior occiput, which is very interesting. Um, and one thing we worry about when we see hemangiomas, in addition to think thinking about basis syndrome, which this baby had a negative workup for other abnormalities. But we worry a lot, babies are obligate nose breathers for the first several months of life. So if anything occludes their nares, they cannot breathe through their nose unless they're crying and then they gasp through their mouth. So anything, any hemangioma in or around the nose is considered a high risk hemangioma and should be treated early on as aggressively as possible. Next. Here's another baby that I saw earlier in my career, again, pre-propranolol who you can see has this very sort of reticulate, um, what might look like a vascular malformation on the right face. It's not quite in the distribution of the V1 or V2 nerve. It's very um, metameric, very, very segmental. And again, um, this baby was felt to have birth trauma. And that was how this was explained um, before we saw them, except when we asked the history, it was the baby was born by C-section, so that doesn't fit. And once again, I point out the, the right upper lip and the mid upper lip is ulcerated. So things that don't proliferate, vascular malformations, do not ulcerate. So we know right off the bat, this is a mangioma. Um, you can see over time, um, this baby was treated at the time the standard of care was high dose prednisone. So you can see she's become cushion wise, but the hemangioma is shrinking. Next. So this is another example of face syndrome or association. Next slide. And I want to show you some examples because I think it's hard to, hard to envision if you've not seen it yourself of what midline sternal defects look like. So this baby was, um, we were consulted to see her in the NICU. Um, she was born with what is called a midline sternal raphe or a supra umbilical raphe where there's failure of the skin to close at the midline from the mid sternum all the way down to the umbilicus. Um, they worked her up for what's called ectopia cordis, where the heart is actually outside the thoracic cavity that was negative, so her heart was in a normal location. And they consulted us at several days of life for this bright red appearance on the left upper chest. And you can also see that there's sort of a flush of redness on the face, and they wanted to know if this could be a vascular malformation. Um, and again, because of our knowledge about faces association, we were very suspicious that this was um, faces association and actually an infantile plaque-like hemangioma. Uh, we recommended propranolol. Um, it took a few days to convince the team that that was, that that was necessary. Next. 
Um, so that was a nice kind of review of how the different situations and faces can present um, all the different morphologies and presentations. And I just want to present one other case um, of what might initially appear to be a vascular malformation or an unusual presentation of a nevus simplex um, that ended up being something different. So uh, my husband's a neurosurgeon and actually called me after doing an angio on this baby and said, I sent this baby to you because I think this, I think he belongs in the dermatology office. I think he may have a hemangioma. Um, so there's a midline, very kind of purple bluish vascular lesion uh, right down the glabella, which might be a normal location for a nevus simplex. However, you can see in, in photo B that when the baby cried or strained, it bulged. So if you go back to our rules by which to practice, any midline lesion that bulges with Valsalva deserves further investigation. Next slide. So this is a picture I won't pretend to know how to read MRI and CT anymore, but this is a gadolinium enhanced extra axial intracranial lesion. You can see the arrows here in pictures A, B, and C, and it shows how the intracranial and the extracranial veins were connected through a small anterior cranial, cranial bony defect. Next. So this is what we term sinus pericranii, and here's a picture of the CT angiogram just for fun. And again, I don't pretend to know how to read these, but they inject dye um, intravascularly and we're able to show that that dye uh, filled the cutaneous vessels uh, on the angiogram, which is very interesting. So this child actually had um, a subtype of sinus pericranii where the skin vessels were necessary in order to appropriately drain the head vessels. And so it was decided not to correct him surgically because correction could actually lead to hydrocephalus. So something like eight or 10 years later, I followed up on him. He's doing well. Um, his most recent <laughs> patient chart said that he had just gone hunting and had shot a deer and he was really excited about that. So he's grown to be a normal child, um, but it is uh, important to advise these patients not to um, have any trauma to this area because again, those vessels communicate directly with the intracranial vessels. Next slide. So following up on a couple other midline lesions, here is a baby who in the groin area has a midline, what looks to be a bright red hemangioma of uh, the labia as well as the perianal area. Next slide. This ended up being a midline hemangioma associated with a tethered cord. So again, following those rules of working up midline lesions with imaging for, of the underlying anatomy to make sure that we're not missing spinal dysraphism. And a tethered cord may not present symptomatically until the child's much older and has a growth spurt. Next. So here's an example of another example of a midline ulcerated hemangioma. Next. This child had what's called sacral or perineal hemangioma associated with pelvis syndrome. Next. Also known as lumbar syndrome, depending on what acronym you want to use. So it's a perianal hemangioma or a perineal hemangioma, external genital malformations, lipomyelin meningocele, kidney abnormalities, imperforate anus, and skin tag. Now I wanna pause for a second and just explain that when we talk about these syndromes in pediatrics, you don't need to have every single one of those criteria. You can have a major criteria such as a midline hemangioma and one of those other things, and you're considered to have the syndrome. Same with FACES syndrome. So don't rule out the syndrome because all five of the, or all six of the elements are not present. Um, a midline hemangioma plus any one of those gets you to pelvis syndrome, but those are just sort of reminders to screen for those things. Next. So I want to move on after we've talked about some vascular malformations. And while this sounds somewhat boring, diaper rashes can be sort of um, vexing, but they can also include some concerning entities that we don't want to miss. Next. Um, you also wanna be able to treat your neighbor. So let's fly through the simple ones. This one next is a classic example of a candidal diaper dermatitis. It's beefy red, there are satellite lesions. Um, it's definitely in the concave surfaces, but sometimes it can also be on the convex surfaces if left untreated, next. Um, it involves the folds, but can kind of spill into the convex surfaces uh, secondarily. And those satellite lesions are the hallmark, next. 
Moving on, um, you can see that a similar rash can occur in the moist neck folds, and you can see it demonstrate the same satellitosis as it would in the diaper area. Next. So this is what we call intertrigo, which is also candidal. Next. Here's another example of intertrigo, but as you can see, something's a little different here. You don't just see the satellite lesions, you see it looking kind of moist and macerated and almost pustular in that skin fold. And I want to show this because sometimes secondarily, um, other things can jump onto the candidal infection. Next. So this is an example of intertrigo with secondary group A strep. So when you see that pustular uh, eruption on top or the purulent your eruption on top of intertrigo, don't forget to cover for both yeast and bacteria. Next. Just a little delay there. Bear with us. I think there's going to be a couple more pictures of similar lesions. Here's a baby with exuberant um, chub folds, is what I like to call them. You can see uh, definitely yeast overgrowth next. But look at this picture and see how shiny uh, certain of the areas are. Sorry for the delay. I think some of these images are pretty high quality and I think they strain uh, some of our computers, which is why Kim is helping me with the presentation. Thank you. So when we see intertrigo that's shiny or wet looking next or purulent or pustular, always remember to cover for both yeast and for bacteria. Next, that baby had group A beta hemolytic strep. So this is not super perplexing, but it is just sort of interesting to point out that um, this is an example of an irritant or an allergic contact dermatitis. And the most common version of these is to urine or just um, irritants in the diaper area. But this baby has a very blue diaper and you can see that just where that blue dye cuts off in the diaper is where the rash cuts off. The rash isn't all the way to the top of the diaper. So in addition to just irritation from moisture and urine, uh, we diagnose this baby with a blue dye sensitivity. Next. Um, and I just saw a, ch a child recently who had an allergic contact dermatitis to his blue mask. And the mom said, I don't know where this could be coming from. And we looked back in his chart, we had seen him as a baby and diagnosed him with a contact dermatitis to his blue diaper. So. Um, when we, when we reminded her of that, she, she was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. I can't believe it. Next. So it tends to be a lifelong thing. Here are some examples of hypoallergenic diapers that are not blue. Next. So um, here's a very common complaint that we see, and often even pediatricians email us about their own baby, or you know, they, they've used everything they know and they can't get the diaper rash to clear up. This is what we call a multifactorial, uh, multifactorial erosive diaper dermatitis. Next, where it may start as, you know, sort of a contact dermatitis, but once the skin gets eroded, it becomes not just inflamed, but bacteria jump in there, yeast jump in there. Next. And this demonstrates um, what we call islands of reepithelialization. And you can see, even though it's kind of gross in this picture, there's active stool on that dermatitis. So just as the skin's trying to heal, the baby stools again, and we can't stop that. Um, and you can see these kind of peripheral islands of re from the outside in. I tend to hit this with multiple um, modalities at once to treat the inflammation, the yeast, and the bacteria. So we might use a, an occlusive diaper paste that has an antifungal in it, um, as well as a topical antibacterial, as well as um, something not to exceed a class six topical steroid and limit the steroid piece to six weeks and then really focus hard on barrier prevention. Next. Here's another example of something that might look very similar. It looks kind of like that multifocal or multifactorial diaper erosive dermatitis. But I want to point out that this is not just perianal. This is perianal and kind of traveling up into the gluteal cleft. So dig back in your brain to 10 minutes ago when we were talking about some of the vascular lesions and hemangiomas. Um, and this is one of the reasons also why I, why I will not do curbside consultations without the full story and images. Uh, next. This ended up being a midline, next, sacral ulcerated hemangioma of the gluteal cleft. And so if we had gotten curbsided on this and were simply told the story of a diaper rash that wasn't improving, and we gave them advice over the phone, this baby would go home and develop ulceration that was not improving over time. Um, and we would have done both the child and the referring practitioner a disservice. So um, we're very friendly about curbsides as long as we have pictures in the story, um, which makes it a real consult. 
Um, I try to be collegial with, with um, our friends in the ER, but I think we just have to make sure we, we always have a picture because again, we don't wanna miss something like this um, that everyone else in the rest of the world would call just an erosive diaper germ, but we know this is an ulcerated hemangioma. Next. Um, here's another common thing that we see after a baby has had um, an irritated diaper dermatitis for long periods of time. You can see that this isn't so much erosive as it is granulomatous. Um, there aren't open areas, but there are these sort of pseudo verrucous or granulomatous nodules and papules. Next. This is an example of GGI or granuloma gladiale and phantom. Next. Sometimes those kids have a history. Here's another example of the same thing. I like to show several pictures just to kind of um, solidify that pattern recognition. Sometimes they can even be pseudo bullous like they are in this picture. Sometimes there's a history of steroid use that has led to this. But in my experience, a lot of these kids have not seen steroid. They've actually just had chronic inflammation. And so we know that yeast plays a role in this, as does inflammation. So we might treat this in a very similar way to try to give the baby airing out time to try to treat the inflammation. If they've not been on a steroid, I might do a class five or six for only two weeks, but to very much remember to treat the yeast and add a barrier. Next. And this is another interesting one. A lot of patients, a lot of people will diagnose this as um, a yeast or a candidal diaper dermatitis, but it's a little different looking, right? Like there's some satellite lesions, but it's very confluent. Um, we call this a napkin diaper dermatitis. It literally almost looks like somebody took a dinner napkin and just laid it right over the perineum of the baby. Next, this is a classic example of inverse psoriasis. And if you're looking for that silvery dry scale, you're probably not gonna find it. Reason being, this is the best moisturized location of the body because that moist diaper area is occluding it and not allowing it to be silvery scaly. Next, here's another example of the same thing. You see how that's so confluent. You've got a couple little satellite lesions up onto the belly, next. When we're trying to figure out what is this, we look for other signs, next. And so um, this is not the same child, full disclosure, but take a look at other intertriginous areas. Look at the belly button. Psoriasis loves the belly button. So if you see a belly button like this with that diaper dermatitis, you don't even need to spend any other time thinking about this. This is psoriasis. Next. So what do we do in this baby where we have a recalcitrant diaper dermatitis? This baby also happened to have anemia, was having blood in the stools and was empirically diagnosed by the pediatrician as having a milk protein allergy and sent to allergy. Um, my friends and colleagues in allergy did a thorough workup and said, this baby does not belong in my office, they belong in yours, could you see them? And we saw her later that day. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. The lesions are in the skin folds, like you might see with candida. There, does, there do appear to be satellite lesions, but they're different looking. They're not just wet, they're not just kind of red or pink, they're really hemorrhagic looking. There's, um, some of them have petechiae and crusting surrounding them. So this is very different looking. This is what we might term malignant seborrheic dermatitis. Next. So um, we biopsied this baby on the first visit. There's an example of the H&E, and then we did a Langerhans stain, stain, which highlights Langerhans cells. And you can see it's grossly positive. Next. So this is an example. Um, S100 also highlighted the Langerhans cells, as did CD1A. Next. So this is an example of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So when you're looking at a recalcitrant diaper dermatitis and you're trying to figure out, is this concerning or not? Surrounding hemorrhage, petechiae, crusting is concerning. Similar lesions in the diaper area, as well as the scalp and other areas that might be behind the ears or on the trunk should not be seen with candidal diaper dermatitis. Now you could have sebderm and a candidal diaper derm, but not with petechiae and hemorrhage. And the anemia, as well as the blood in the stool was a red flag. Um, next. So this baby ended up in hemonc. This is another interesting case of recalcitrant diaper dermatitis. And I want to point out that it was also present with recalcitrant eczema, which isn't really eczema on the face. Very active kind of reddish brown border, very well demarcated border in both the groin and on the face. Next. So this was a case of acrodermatitis enteropathica or zinc deficiency. So as it turns out, um, this baby was exclusively breastfed, um, which is not the classic story for zinc deficiency unless the breast milk is deficient. So it turned out this mother's breast milk level of zinc was zero. So um, she was a deficient secretor of zinc into the breast milk. And so once the baby was supplemented, next, within two weeks, this cleared up. 
So what I would recommend in cases like this where you're very suspicious is send off a zinc level, send off an alkaline phosphatase level too, because the zinc takes about a week to come back, whereas alkaline phosphatase, which is a zinc dependent enzyme, usually comes back in about a day. So you can get a sense of whether you're on the right track and you can go ahead and start supplementation while you're waiting for your labs to come back so that the child has rapid improvement. Next. Now moving on to some more interesting diaper dermatitides. This baby came in with um, a quote unquote history of recurrent UTIs. And when we asked more about that, what she said is that uh, the urine is often red. She gets sent for a urinalysis, treated for a UTI. The urine culture is usually negative. So her chief complaint was pink diapers. Next. And also um, extreme photosensitivity with blistering in the sun. Uh, extremely irritable, miserable child. You can see all the sun exposed areas have blistering and even some scarring. There's a nail dystrophy from the same. Next. This was um, a classic example of, um, I know, actually, let me back up one step. Because it was not easy to collect a urine sample <laughs> from the baby who was miserable and uncooperative, we decided to try just wood slamping her diaper, which was actually really effective. So I just want to show you that when you wood slamp the diaper of somebody with this disorder, it does also give you the coral red fluorescence. Um, I hope you can appreciate that in this slide. Next. So this was a classic example of CEP or con congenital erythropoietic porphyria. It is one of the rarest of the porphyrias. It's autosomal recessive. Um, it's a mutation in the uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthesase gene. And it presents in infancy with severe photosensitivity, blistering, conjunctivitis. They can have red teeth, extra hair growth, hemolytic anemia, and also thrombocytopenia. This baby went on, um, the mother was very proactive um, and really pushed for a bone marrow transplant. Um, she had a rocky course, but is doing beautifully now um, and is able to go out and lead a pretty normal life. Um, but she created a whole website about her journey. And, um, you know, it was fun. I like, you know, when somebody has been to that many physicians to be able to tell them, you know what, this is your last stop. Um, we know what this is and we're gonna see this through the end for you. Next. So I wanna present a couple other um, photosensitive dermatitides in babies and then we'll wrap up with the quiz in a few minutes. This is a three month old female who had the luxury of vacationing in Hawaii at the age of two months. Um, and while in Hawaii, she developed a blistering eruption after sun exposure. The parents had applied sunscreen and so they concluded along with their pediatrician that this was an allergic reaction to the sunscreen. Next. Um, in fact, we diagnosed her with neonatal lupus. So this was a rash that occurred in a photo distributed area, what we call raccoon eyes. The lesions can be telangiectatic or atrophic. They can also be bullous. And the mothers could be asymptomatic. In fact, in my experience, that's been the most common scenario. Or the mothers may have diagnosed or more commonly undiagnosed Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis, or even mixed connective tissue disease. So you want to send off when you're suspicious an SSA and SSB, which are most commonly positive, but also U1 RNP. Um, if you're that suspicious, it's probably good to get an EKG at the very first visit because up to 30% of these babies can have a congenital AV block. Next. Um, here's a similar infant that presented with very subtle findings. And I will be completely honest with you. I missed this on the first visit. And I took these pictures because I'm like, I think I'm missing something. Um, you can see kind of a shiny area of atrophoderma on the right abdomen. The baby was very irritable and cried the entire visit. And I, I really did not appreciate much on the face. So in our differential, we said that congenital anetoderma, you know, we want to follow and see if this progresses and we may consider biopsy next. And one month later, you can see the raccoon eyes and you can see the atrophy on the nasal bridge. And um, I was kicking myself for not saying come back in two weeks because um, I feel like uh, there may be some permanent deformity there. The mother was not too worried about this, um, but I can't stress the importance of follow-up, the importance of being honest with yourself if you're not sure what something is, and the importance of photography in the record, because sometimes we learn from that original visit. I can now go back and look at those original pictures and say, next time I see atrophy like that, I'm going to send off the SSA, SSB, UN, RNP from the start. Next. This mother, and you can see some closer up, um, pictures of kind of the telangiectatic lesions that are periocular, the raccoon eyes. 
and also the atrophy. Next. This mother had a positive SSA. She was completely asymptomatic. Um, I, I made a mistake on the slide. She was SSB negative, SSA positive, and her U1 RNP was normal. Um, she was seen by rheumatology and did not require a further workup. But she's going to stay plugged in with them. Um, her EKG was normal. Her CBC and hepatic function were also normal. I want to point out that it's much more common to see cardiac abnormalities with SSA and B than it is to see with U1 RNP positivity. It's almost unheard of with U1 RNP. Um, the SSA and the SSB has a much greater affinity for binding to the AV node in utero and creating a scar, which is what creates the AV block. Um, and that is not as common with U1 RNP. And so when you find a baby who has neonatal lupus and the mother is positive for SSA or B, it's not just important for that, um, that mother to know that she may have an increased risk of rheumatologic disease, but it's important for future pregnancies because those antibodies are not gonna go away. And those same antibodies, even though they might not have created heart block in this infant, could theoretically create heart block in a future infant. And so it's, um, it's nice to plug those families if they are gonna have future children in with high risk maternal fetal medicine. Um, I'm not up on the standard of care for what they do in those situations. Um, there is some discussion in the literature about high dose steroids sometimes. Next. Okay, I want to wrap it up with the last few slides. This is a five day old who presented with pustules and vesicles on the groin legs. You can see they're in sort of a blashcoid distribution. Next. So diaper rash, but not really. Linear array of vesicles. Next. This is a classic presentation of the vesicular stage of incontinentia pigmenti. Next. There are, this is excellent dominant. It can be lethal in males unless the male um, has mosaicism, such as in the situation of Klinefelter's, and it's from a Nemo mutation, which leads to apoptosis um, and the inability to modulate inflammation as well as blistering. Next. I wanna just show you a couple of pictures of the different stages. Um, it progresses from vesicular to verrucous to hyperpigmented. Um, and eventually in the much older children or adults, hypopigmented or atrophic. Next. Here's an example of the uh, uh, dental abnormalities on the left with a single central incisor at birth. And then you can see in the other photo, the very verrucous blashcoid lesions um, present on the extremities. And I think I have another picture of the slide after this next. Um, very, very verrucous. You can see that straight line on the right side, down, right, right down the middle of the, the calf. Really remarkable um, sort of uh, demonstration of Blashcoid's lines. Next. Here's the hyperpigmented and verrucous stage. Next. Next. And finally, the plain hyperpigmented stage. And it's interesting. I used to think the hyperpigmented stage was sort of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but it often occurs on the trunk, not where the vesicular lesions had been. And then you can see a mild scarring alopecia on the vertex scalp. Next. Next. Here's a male who had incontinentia pigmenti. You can see it's a very mild case. This male must have had somatic, somatic mosaicism, was otherwise normal. Next. You can have the associated syndrome findings, but they're much less common than in, uh, in females. This was a newborn that presented with similar looking lesions, bulli in blashcoid distribution, but they're a little different. The NICU thought maybe this could have been epidermal lysis bullosa. Next. But I wanna show an up close. This isn't so much vesicular as it is atrophic. And what we're seeing here is herniation of fat through the dermis and epidermis. Next. This is an example, and again, there's a scarring alopecia, next, of Gold syndrome, which is also X-linked dominant. It's a mutation in the PORCN gene. They can have skeletal abnormalities, um, as well as GU, GI, and neurologic abnormalities, next. And then I wanna finish up with a, a very common thing. I think I've seen, I'm gonna say like five or six cases in the last six months of this for some odd reason. Um, very commonly presents at a few weeks of life, um, erythematous indurated plaques, they can be anywhere. They can be on the trunk or extremities, not usually on the face. Next. This is an example of sub-Q fat necrosis of the newborn. Next. 
Here's another example in a skinnier baby where it looks a little bit more nodular as opposed to plaque-like, next. And these babies often are full term, but present uh, within the first couple of weeks of life with the skin findings after a somewhat difficult delivery. So they might have had um, meconium aspiration, perineal hypoxia or hypothermia. And it's very important to monitor weekly calciums. And if they've been normal for, every, for a couple of weeks, then monitor them monthly because as the calcium supplies in the skin mobilize, they can develop hypercalcemia. Um, usually they do fine with it and are asymptomatic, but if they have irritability, hypercalcemia, or poor feeding, they may need IV fluids as well as a low calcium formula. Next. So we covered a lot of territory, both common and more rare. I want to thank you for your attention at seven o'clock on a winter night. And I'm going to leave it to Kim. Thank you, Kim. That was like very smooth transition. Leave it to Kim to present us with a Kahoot quiz and um, let's test your knowledge. I think before that, we have a few questions. So uh, oh, yeah, if you'd yeah. like to do that. Hey, hey Robin, that, that was fantastic. I mean, I was taking notes. I know you were worried about the number of slides, but I'm a fast talker. <laughs> no, 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 that, that was wonderful. And you know, Thank there's you. so much more ground for you to cover. And I was taking notes the whole time. Yay, on my okay. work phone, just learning. So fantastic. Um, yeah. We have a number of questions. I don't think we're going to get to them all, and maybe we can uh, send them out to the participants sure. and we can answer some of them later. But the first question was, what is the best time to do an MRI in Sturge Weber? And is it useless after a certain age, knowing that the seizures happen usually within the first two years of life? That's a good question. So I, as much as I hate to sedate a young infant, because it often um, does require sedation to do an MRI. At certain children's centers, they can do sort of a swaddle and keep the baby still without sedating. But I think doing MRI at presentation, because if you do find uh, vascular malformations of the leptomeninges, it's helpful to connect them with neurology early on to make sure that there aren't occult seizures happening that the parents may not be recognizing because again, that can be very bad for development. So we want to treat them as early as possible. That's a great question. I don't think it's useless and it is, the question is good because it's not like you're going to do anything to stop those malformations. They've already occurred, but you can do things to stop the seizures and to make sure that they don't go undetected. All right, one, one or two more quick ones. For intertrigo with strep, would you cover with a systemic or topical antibiotic? Fantastic question. I have myself called infectious disease to ask that very question because it's often the baby under the age of two months in whom if they had a systemic infection, you might want to admit them for rule out sepsis. And so I would never want to miss that. So the answer that infectious disease gave me is if the baby is afebrile, well appearing, I usually get a culture, start them on topical mupirocin as well as a topical azole antifungal. By the time the culture comes back and I call them to tell them they're positive, they're usually improving. If they were not improving at that stage, then I would cover them with an oral antibiotic. And any fever, irritability, or poor feeding would get them um, consideration for a roulette sepsis workup under the age of two months. All right, one more quick one. Would These are in, great questions. In acrodermatitis enteropathica, would the ALKFOS be very low? Yes, yeah, so we usually expect in growing children for the ALKFOS to be high, but because it's a zinc-dependent enzyme, if you have a zinc deficiency, the ALKFOS may be unusually low. Now, I have to be honest, I feel like ALKFOS, when you get it back, can be all over the board, and I feel like it can be a somewhat nonspecific um, enzyme to truly hang your hat on as the only hook that you're using. Um, so it can be an indicator that you're on the right track, but I always like following that with an actual zinc level. Fantastic. So we're going to hopefully uh, be able to respond by email to some of the questions, to everyone that participated. There, there were some other comments that were, thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh -huh. And thank you for a truly outstanding presentation. I, thank you. Maybe that, is that the University of Pittsburgh residents that I paid before tonight's talk? Yeah, yeah good, good work. I, <laughs> Thanks, I guys. That. Yeah. I'll pay you tomorrow. So we're going we're gonna to put up the Kahoot. And while that's loading, um, just a few comments. Um, this is the last national codochromes of this year by Visual DX, but we're planning more in the future and we really value your feedback. So at the end of this uh, evening's webinar in Kahoot, when you log out, there's a survey. Can you please, please help us with suggestions of what codochromes you'd like to see 
in 2021. Some of you might have participated in the four part webinar series that we did with the New England Journal of Medicine and the Skin of Color Society that concluded last week with an excellent panel on systemic uh, signs, signs of skin signs of systemic disease in uh, patients of color. And we're planning to really do more with uh, Skin of Color in 2021. We've actually also changed the interface of Visual DX in the last month, where the desktop a month ago, we brought forward onto the desktop a skin of color starting point for your differential diagnoses. And there's also some new filtering available throughout the dermatology parts of Visual DX. The, today, the Android version went live that brings out skin of color on the smartphone, the Android. And I haven't seen it yet on my iPhone version, but I think that's either uh, this evening or by tomorrow that we'll, we'll be seeing um, that functionality on both iPhone and Android. Uh, Kim has put in the chat that if you go to the homepage of visualdx.com, you'll see a page uh, that's on diversity. And we're starting a, a large project on this. And we're really looking for residents and faculty that are passionate about changing, changing medicine and really, um, really doing more for diversity and equity and knowledge. So we, we also look forward to your comments in the chat there. Uh, we're doing more work in AI and machine learning and, and really pushing the, the frontier of medical informatics. So any uh, residents or students that are on the call or faculty that have interest in you know, bringing dermatology into the digital age, we love hearing from you. So uh, I think we've loaded up enough people to, to do the Kahoot quiz. I see, I see a few are just joining and um, give it your best shot. At the end, we're gonna announce the winner. And I, I also wanna say on the first slide, uh, we also want to recognize our past Kodachrome's winner was, was back in September, um, Carrie, who's at uh, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. So we always start out the Kahoot with the previous winner. And then after that, we have nine questions. So good luck.
All right, I hope that's not you. Yeah, I promise everybody I'm, I'm not playing on my phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so congratulations, Art. You won. <laughs> we're going to have to investigate whose email that was. And well, we'll be in touch with them day. and send them off that Amazon gift card. So, thanks everyone for participating. Thank for Dr. Garris for helping putting together those questions and for and, the presentation tonight. Yeah, that really fantastic. Thanks again, Robin. And Thank you for all that you do for us and for the residents, because I'll tell you, we all use Visual DX on a daily basis. Um, yeah, well, we're still having fun at Visual DX. It's only getting better. We're expanding it all the time. Lots of good things are happening. I just really would hope that everybody that's on tonight's webinar fill out the survey when they leave. And everybody have a great holiday week. And hopefully COVID will be behind us soon. So everyone be healthy, be safe. Good holidays. Thanks. Take care, everybody.